Is this my co Yes, there we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Whitworth. I'm Alistair Hudson, director of the Whitworth and Manchester Art Gallery. Um, I'm going to welcome you to what kind of art? This, uh, tonight's discussion that we're going to have tonight, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, but before we get going, we're going to play a short video. And then uh, I will say a few more words before we start. In this form we call body, there resides God's light. When this form is no more, there will only be his light. I want to live in a city where there are no spaces or places that I can't go. Where we have diversity that's cherished. We want a flourishing city. We want a welcoming city. There will only be his light. Shape notes singing in England. Sufi chant, how will these have anything to do with one another? How could that be a bridge to something? Why have borders? What does that do to people? How do we physically and practically appreciate difference? I would say all art is process with people. The solid bits that get thrown off that process get turned into art that we see in art galleries on walls. Suzanne really taught me that the connection of social and art was the most potent force possible to uncork what the creative mind can do. It's a legacy not just in terms of the actual film, but that human connection of individuals, hearts and minds. I still hear the conversations come up at the local stables. It's existing in a museum space, but still exists in the space that it was made to. We're doing policy and research work, but expressing it through art. There's something about Suzanne that's just fundamentally open to listening to people. She really knows how to put other people forward and allow them to do what they do and give them that space and oxygen, but at the same time, to put in the systems in place and to create timelines and pathways and structures that actually get you to where you want to go. My real hope for this project is that the Whitworth and the Manchester Art Gallery are transformed into places that really have a central function in the city that people see and in a way they're not institutions of individual expression but communal expression and they become generally transformative for people in their lives. What I really look for in a city is a community. I'd like it to be a safe place where perhaps some of the young people get involved with making it safe. Maybe if we could have a conversation to say something to the police without getting locked up and they could say back to us, it will break down so many walls. It should keep pace in every area and meeting the needs of every age group. The process of change requires partnership. There is power in unity. There's some very strong relationships being developed. It's all around using art as a tool. I want to see this place being the real social educational institution it was designed to be. Okay, so that gives you a taste of what we're up to here. Uh, what kind of city, question mark, um, is a project we have developed with Suzanne Lacey for many years um, and has now come to full fruition and is growing and moving beyond, I think. And the principle was to make an exhibition that went beyond the exhibitionary because this is kind of what I'm interested in, is going beyond the exhibitionary era into new ways, new platforms in which we, we work with art and artists and art in society. So the idea was to, yes, to do an exhibition which looked at examples of Suzanne's work, but also to build a public program and activity around it that took it beyond the normal paradigms of how a museum works. In effect, what this means is moving from beyond the world of pure representation into the world of operation. Art actually doing things. Art actually making an impact. But of course, the question is, how do we do that? And what does it look like? What does it feel like? And, and to what end? So 
we're going to have a little bit of an interlude tonight to discuss maybe some of these issues, but it sits within uh, a kind of four-day framework of activities that are connected with the work you see in the exhibition here, but also at Manchester Art Gallery, um, addressing key themes of our moment. So yesterday, we worked with our friends from Briarfield in Lancashire, who came here. Um, you've seen on this film here tonight, and you've seen in Circle and Square, the project that has been evolving with communities, with different cultures, faiths, on this uh, the amazing choral piece that you kind of see on the screen there. Um, and to start to ask questions about how we do real, develop real community cohesion and real agency in those communities. Today, at Manchester Art Gallery, we've worked with our amazing group of women, our Uncertain Futures women, who are leading a campaign to change life outcomes for women over 50 in Manchester, in the city, particularly where we're facing all the issues around intersectionality as well, combined with aging, combined with the problems we're now facing around us. Tomorrow, we have a whole day, day on youth agency based on the ideas that were initiated with Suzanne's work, Oakland projects developed in the Bay Area in the 90, throughout the 1990s, where we're going to start asking questions about what kind of curriculum, what kind of life pathways can we create for young people in Manchester now and do that collectively as a city? And on Saturday, we're going to be looking at borders, invisible borders, and performance and how we start to transform the city to start to kind of work our way around these issues of these lines that are drawn in the sand that are sometimes arbitrary, sometimes political, sometimes cultural in a way referring back to the work that Suzanne made in, in uh, our on the border in Ireland that you see here also in the Whitworth. The big question at the end of this is what kind of city do we want to live in? What kind of culture do we want to make together? What kind of society do we want to build? That's the ultimate question. That's the ultimate question at the heart of a kind of a lot of what I would say is the, 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 the best intentions of art and of modernity that somehow have been suppressed. And maybe now is the moment to bring those to the fore. So tonight, I think we can discuss a lot of these issues that weave in and out of that territory. Um, and I'm delighted to have with us tonight, all the way from Berkeley, <laughs> Shannon Jackson. Thank you so much for coming with us. Uh, Shannon Jackson, for the record, I'm going to... I have been presented with a, with a, with a large CV, but basically I'm going to say... Shannon's a big deal, Googler. We also have Suzanne Lacey, who is a big deal, Googler, if you need to, and Leanne Green, um, who here has curated Su Suzanne's exhibition um, at the Whitworth with us and masterminded it so beautifully and brilliantly. Um, so is also here to, to discuss uh, you know, uh, the issues in play tonight, along with me. So I'm going to hand over now to Shannon, I think, where you're going to take us into your world. <laughs> All right, thank you. I am going to speak for a while, and I realized I didn't, um, I didn't practice on here, but I'm assuming it's going to be self-evident. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to Suzanne and to Alistair, to Holly, Leanne, and the entire Whitworth and MAG team for the invitation to be here. Uh, this question, what kind of art, is of course my rejoinder to the uh, platforms question, what kind of city? I care deeply about both of those questions and what they mean together. They also invite a range of other questions, as Alistair already said, about what kind of um, pub what kind of society, what kind of public sphere. Um, from my own sector, what kind of education, what kind of university do we want to live in? Uh, so all of those questions are very important to me. The role of art and thinking about them is always important to me. Uh, I'll say that I come, as Alistair said, from UC Berkeley. I'm still on its time zone, so forgive me. The, uh, I, this is the home of the free speech movement, you may know. It's also uh, the home of the flagship University of California, the flagship University of California, uh, a, a def defunded public institution where we're constantly working on how to cultivate both the, um, 
history of, uh, and commitments and principles to free speech that we're known for and the co uh, commitment to public duty and public accountability that public education is known for. That's a dialectic to work in those, in those two domains, right? Um, uh, they're not the same thing, freedom of speech and public accountability, uh, but they are complicate each other when they're together. And in my view, they make each other better. It's a kind of dialectic that is um, a privilege to inhabit. It's um, also one that is a necessary dialectic and one that should not be misused or taken for granted or ignored. And so it's with that in mind that I'd like to invite Suzanne Lacey to join me for a minute um, because we do want to share uh, and have a chance to acknowledge our concern that the privilege of inhabiting exactly that dialectic is being misused here in Manchester. Many of you are aware tonight that Alistair Hudson, the director of MAG and the Whitworth, whose vision <laughs> has brought us together, has been threatened with removal um, by the University of Manchester. The reasons given have been aired and then retracted such that uh, the logic is actually somewhat unclear. Inside a platform then that is thinking about what kind of city we want to live in, Suzanne and I couldn't help but think about what kind of university we'd want to work in. From the UM's own letter to its staff, they say a university and a museum are places where, quote, we can debate, discuss, disagree well. Their rights and duties, including the protection of, include the protection of academic freedom, freedom of speech, and expression and duties under equality laws, including public sector equality duty, unquote. So there's that dialectic again, and I think we couldn't agree more. I have been a professor, a campus vice chancellor, a student not only at Berkeley, but at Harvard, Northwestern, and Stanford universities, and I'm a board member of many museums. Suzanne Lacey is a professor, a public artist, a former dean, a faculty member, a member of several arts organizations as well. And we both understand entirely the difficulty of maintaining freedom and public duty, to cultivate expression and to run an institution. But it cannot be <laughs> that the invocation of public sector duties or individual privacy rights forestalls institutional transparency. It's baffling that a museum director who is known throughout the country and the world for his public-minded leadership is being put at risk under the frame of public sector duty. We expect our universities to be transparent about their policies, as well as to afford all employees due process in their employment practices. Alistair Hudson was hired at a high level to provide a vision and he's worked assiduously to implement that vision as a public servant on behalf of the city of Manchester. We both considered withdrawing um, from this gathering to voice our concern, but Alistair and his staff wanted us to continue in order to do our work. So we are here. And we are here to urge the university to rescind its announcement, to engage in debate and bracing discussion and also to let this visionary cultural leader, this civic leader, continue to do his work as well. All right, so back to my work, <laughs> uh, which is coincident fully with so much of what's going on here as a platform, um, um, as a museum, as a university, as a city. What I'd like to do is offer some speculation on my title, what kind of art, but also the social value of aesthetics, um, arts and cities, partly because so much of my work has been, has cared so deeply about this conjunction, um, social value, aesthetics, cities, art. My very first book was on the history of the role of the arts and performance in Jane Addams' settlement movement, which Suzanne is one of the only people who understands that conjunction and the um, interesting connections between the uh, US history of social reform and contemporary art practice. In my more recent work in social works for public servants or 
later in this book coming up backstage is I have a more contemporary focus, but all throughout I'm always interested in artists who embrace democratic process, policy, and infrastructure as a kind of potent artistic material, not only a um, secondary goal. But when one starts to propose and promote the social role of art, the role of socially engaged art, one can be confronted with a first retort, which we can say can be a first speculation to add to my speculation, speculative talk tonight. So isn't all art socially engaged? And in fact, Al Alistair's introduction suggested it was. All art, whatever we're encountering, is in still about organizing bodies in space. Is it even meaningful to isolate the social apart from the art so that one can restitch that relation? Let's think about a painting, huh, not just any painting, let's think about Jackson Pollock's Lavender Mist, a painting that some critics and historians herald as an epitome of a modernist stance on the flatness of painting. This would be an example, we could say, of modernity suppresses, su um, suppressed argument. But here, um, and for many, the essence of painting meant that this was a kind of painting, a kind of art that did not need its social context to complete itself. Of course, a network of other critics and artists and historians argued the opposite, that this painting, generated from the active, horizontal, aggressively dripped behaviors and gestures of, yes, a fairly macho action painter, were deeply resonant with its social context, with its social conditions, and that social conditions are, are contingent are, and animate its making and its receiving. Alan Capro, uh, fellow artist and Suzanne Lacey's mentor, was a key ambassador for that social reading of the action of action painting, deciding to take its behaviors and gestures quite physically into three and four dimensions in order to create the happening as an aesthetic form, a genealogy um, that Suzanne is very much in, and we can say cleaning conditions is deeply in. If we're thinking about then the social relation in art, perhaps one could say that all art is social in some way, even and perhaps Interestingly, when it tries not to be. But we could also say that not all art knows itself to be social, and that certainly not all art makers or institutions or universities or receivers or museums know this sociality or can fully anticipate it. Indeed, sometimes it's most potent and most virulent and most transformative forms of aesthetic sociality come to us unexpectedly. It's sometimes in the social value of aesthetics might be measured in the integrity with which we face these unbidden socialities, that is reactions, debate, discussion, disagreement that we did not anticipate, again, that comes to us unbidden. All right. So I just used the word, okay, I'll say this then. Not all artists, all art is potentially socially engaged, but not all art knows it is. And what happens when it finds out it does? It is. A second thing, having brought up uh, this idea of, of, about social values, is we also can note that not all social values are the same. Um, that indeed socially engaged art has more than one social value. Think about the different ways that some citizens might argue for the importance of the arts. That it brings beauty to our lives. That it forges connection amongst us or social cohesion that it provokes deliberation and debate. Um, for some artists, such as Suzanne Lee, say, indeed, debate and discursive conversation are essential tools of the artist, uh, a perhaps almost a medium for the art form. So while some artists argue for beauty, others argue for provo provocation and, 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 and critical defamiliarizing effects. Its conceptual effects actually defamiliarize the world in which we live rather than reaffirm it. So whether thinking about circle and the square, we could just think about that and think about it as a process, an image, a set of sounds, a set of conversations, an apparatus, a video, an installation, a meal. One can see all these different social values and more at work, probably for different receivers. Some receivers might receive such a work ironically, some earnestly, some might see the social value of aesthetics is something that is solution-seeking, out-of-the-box reframing of our world. Others turn to art because they want respite, because they want escape. The arts are, of course, also about personal expression, sometimes therapeutic expression, sometimes freedom of expression, 
And often, and sometimes the art that um, Suzanne often likes to make, Alistair is curating and that I like to follow, is art that also mobilizes systems, activating systems, getting them to talk to each other. This is, of course, where what kind of city, that question meets the notion of what kind of art. I often recall at this type of moment the uh, thinking of the late geographer Neil Smith, who talked about the concept of jumping scales and, and endorsed certain kinds of art practices that crossed sim si systems in this way. Here, when he says, they provide oppositional means for reinscribing and reorganizing the urban geography of the city. They fracture previous boundaries of daily intercourse and establish new, new ones. They redefine the scale of everyday life through the contradiction between absurdity and functionality. As instruments of political empowerment, they enable people to jump scales, to inhabit, you could say, an ever wider geographical field. So maybe we can have that in mind as we go, but even as I talk about the fact that there's more than one social value in socially engaged art, there's also more than one kind of aesthetic when it comes to the arts. Something happens, of course, when we start to reckon with the fact that the arts are not one thing. Indeed, even the mobilizing platform here is making use of a variety of artistic forms, those that might hail from painting, those that might hail from theater and performance or dance or music. Here, I listed a few just to reckon that the fact that we are differently expert in different fields, artists have different skills in different fields, um, and that there might be a relation and a different relationship between, say, the community engaged practice of somebody like my colleague and friend Joanna Highgood who begins life as a choreographer and a dancer um, and engages in broad scale community engagement. And somebody like also a dear friend, Paul Ramirez Jonas, who began life as a sculpture and whose engaged practice in community hails from that form, expanding beyond that form. So as blatantly obvious as such statements might be, and I always have to clear the air with this kind of statement, it does seem to me that sometimes the uh, discussions and debate might happen um, amongst art forms around who is skilled in what form, um, who is more um, uh, socially engaged, who is more wedded to the ethic of entertainment, who's too commercial, um, whose skills are, 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 are appropriately critical and whose aren't, that those kind of debates can happen. So of course we might say that here we're talking about the social variant of all of these forms. Not only these forms in their traditional legacies, but we could say the action of action painting, the social nature of social sculpture, time-based photography, site-specific dance, that all of these forms have also been imploded in many ways by an experimental ethos and by a social impulses. And we might say that we are actually interested in thinking about the relation there. And there again, we'll find many of us also um, hoping and aspiring and investigating whether or not these domains of socially engaged art actually can be counted on to fight neoliberal tendencies in society, in the public sphere at this time. And indeed, a huge part of my career is about trying to identify and think about artists and whether or not artist groups can indeed um, um, uh, uh, advance that kind of fight, advance that kind of resistance. Before I can go a little bit further, we might want to clear the air to make sure that we all know what neoliberalism um, actually means, and I'll do it by quoting my colleague, Wendy Brown, who from her book on neoliberalism, where she, I think, helpfully distinguishes neoliberalism from liberalism, noting that here in neoliberalism, where there is only a homo economicus, and when the domain of the political itself is rendered in economic terms, the foundation vanishes for citizenship concerned with public things and common good. So when in thinking about the financialization or the bottom line or the client relationships of any particular domain, that's the kind of neoliberal frame at work. The replacement then of citizenship defined as a concern with the public good by citizenship is reduced um, to the citizen as homo economicus and it eliminates the very idea of a people a demos asserting its collective political sovereignty. So we'll have that in mind while asking through 
so much of my, at least, teaching and writing, and so much of the teaching and writing I know to be present in the room, as well as the art making I know to be present in the room, including Suzanne's, so many could say that we are in a constant e effort to reactivate that vanishing conception of citizenship, to activate concern for the common good and for public things. I'm always inspired by artists who cultivate that awareness and recognition of interdependent relationships with social institutions, um, contra any kind of neoliberal celebration that might celebrate the independent, autonomous personhood separate from social systems. So rather than pitching the turn to the social as an anti-aesthetic gesture, as the opposite of aesthetic rigor, I'm always really interested in conceiving the heteronymous practice of socially engaged artists as a, as a very rigorous aesthetic pursuit. So thinking about then the social value of aesthetics, we might also think about some other permutations, say the aesthetic values of the social, thinking about how sociality is embedded in some of these forms, and it's in the, exactly that embedding that is getting released um, and mobilized when socially engaged artists comes to, come to town. But indeed, at the same time as that this pursuit and this principle and speculation is active, I'm often confronted with another argument a counter to that counter, because so many would argue um, that socially engaged art actually capitulates to neoliberal tendencies. So how does that argument go? It goes in a few different directions. One might first say there is the instrumentalization critique. The notion that, that socially engaged art, state-sponsored art, Grant, uh, art from granting councils, et cetera, is so focused on efficacy and social impact and outcomes that it is uh, Im embedded in a mechanism of measurement, of categorization and counting and quantification that feeds a neoliberal impulse. Moreover, it's often argued within this frame that socially engaged artists are, are enabling a neoliberalism of neoliberalization of the public sector by uh, taking over um, the job of the state, by entering as band-aids, bandages there to repair the effects of a defunded civic, state, and national systems. So there, the effort is to say that that kind of critique puts artists into positions where it's very hard to engage with policy circles or civic circles or get a grant from an out, um, art council without being accused of a kind of capitulation, of getting out of one's lane and into a lane that one shouldn't be um, authorized to enter or saddled or burdened with entering. A second kind of argument which I've made elsewhere um, is an argument that goes in a slightly different direction and it might be called the experiential critique of neoliberalism. The notion that this turn to the social, this turn to service, this turn to immaterial life and immaterial engagement and conversation is very much in sync with a, Fordist, with a turn from a Fordist model of object making and commodities to a post-Fordist model of um, service providing. So here, this argument usually goes by invoking the, um, biz, uh, the Harvard Business School reports of the experience economy. Perhaps I'm getting enough nods in this room that people know this argument well. Uh, where uh, the, the argument that the turn to experience and the creation of these broad, potent, catalytic experiences is perfectly in sync with a post-Fordist turn in late capitalism, that it's very much in sync with um, uh, a turn to service. Participating resistance here then looks like neoliberal incorporation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> Do we really believe this? Okay. Um, can it really be that one of the most under-resourced populations of the planet, artists, could be taxed with this kind of insidious effects? If we really want to figure out where the neoliberalization of the public sector is happening, do we really want to lay the blame um, at art with artists? Um, after all, at, at, at the moment that you're thinking that artists are capable of doing so much, you might hear another kind of counter-argument, an argument that says that actually, no, aesthetic practices are too abstract to be useful, too ornamental to be useful, too conceptual, too much ornament, not enough substance, preoccupied with form, not with system, capitulating to entertainment, not education. Here's more accusations start to come within and amongst artists, as everyone accuses and finger points around who is too um, 
commercial, ornamental, too beautiful, too abstract, too unintelligible. So, if we think here then about artists, think about Suzanne's work, and think about arguments that might wonder, why so beautiful? Why those lines? Why that color? Why that abstraction? What is this actually um, doing? Why that quilt? Why the organization of that form? And wonder what, what um, the role of the arts truly socially might be. Of course, you can be countered at the moment that you try to answer that question with yet another counter, counter, counter to the counter, which would be to argue that socially engaged art, when it tries, when it tries um, and becomes too useful, it's too useful to be aesthetic, too useful to be art anymore. And it's in precisely in that exchange there that we can look at different photos and documentations of Suzanne's work, and people might ask, why those hugs? Why the potlucks? Why the walks? Why the manifestos? Why, why the touching? Why the declaring? Isn't this a, a level of functionality, a kind of engagement, a kind of heteronymous engagement that, that takes us away from aesthetic practice, keeping us away from the proper autonomy of art? Of course, I'm replaying this in order to remake the argument that I constantly find myself making, which is about trying to get these domains to merge. Isn't it actually in walking the dialectic that Suzanne's work here gains traction? Between walking that dialectic between beauty and functionality, between abstraction and utility, isn't this actually potentially the way we can better face those socialities that come to us unbidden in the midst of the art project? Here again in Crystal Quilt, or in thinking too about uh, cleaning conditions and the ways in which uh, uh, Suzanne engages with the fact that Alan Capra once abstracted the nature of everyday life by creating sweeping performances, and Suzanne goes on to abstract his abstraction by reminding him uh, and all of us of the gendered and classed labored behind sweeping and other cleaning conditions. Isn't it actually in this dialectic that something special happens? I think too about bringing that sense of the dialectic and that interaction into the work of Tanya Bruguera, a key in person who's inspired so much of what has happened here in Manchester, or one of my favorites, I can never do a talk without her, Merle Letterman Eucalus, who goes from washing, goes from inhabiting those cleaning conditions, and goes on to become the unpaid um, artist in residence of the New York Department of Public Sanitation, who is walking again that dialectic uh, between beauty and functionality, um, between abstraction and system. So it's there that I often want to say that art and I'm not gonna even call them socially engaged art, to think more about how arts redirect public systems on which they simultaneously depend. I almost put this as a twofer, but I actually wanted to have one statement where you feel the dialectic in the statement. New kinds of connections and outcomes, it seems to me, occur under the banner of art. Say, consider Oakland projects, um, or the many gatherings that are now occurring under uncertain futures or what kind of city, where they get a different kind of mobilization, perhaps, because they're an art project. Maybe people listen differently and decide to participate because it's art, rather than because it's a social worker coming to your door. Um, perhaps there's a bit of latitude, a different kind of enthusiasm um, when the arts come to town. At the same time, in these kinds of projects, the arts are engaging with public systems, redirecting public systems, but also know they depend upon them. There is not, it's not a world in, that is not free of, um, of, of systems and structures um, that go on to make sure that we have a city in which everyone can thrive. And again, to invoke, um, I'll invoke some of these other artists, but also to invoke even even Lavender Mist, and also the Whitworth and Manchester Art Gallery and Alistair's introduction, that, that this kind of uh, inhabiting and redirecting of public systems while depending on them is something that happens across the arts um, in different registers and different levels of consciousness and in different forms. But that conjunction is always of interest to me. Yes, it's always the case and often is the case that arts 
activate self-expression, sometimes therapeutic expression, sometimes individual expression, sometimes things that we might decide to call free expression or modes of expression that need to be defended under principles of freedom of speech. That can be part of it. That is part of this ethos. And you think again, too, about Suzanne's many projects, including um, uncertain futures and aging and intersectionality, where stories are shared, where individuals um, uh, uh, share stories in highly individual acts. Sometimes they might even feel like therapeutic acts, sitting at tables or on the floor together or in reflection, private dialogue, tears, laughter. But I'm always interested in that moment when th there is a public sharing of that, of those individual private acts. What happens when participants enter and share that kind of speech in a public setting? Is, the, is it one that holds accountable? Do they hold themselves accountable? Do they face the unease of doing that? Do people hold themselves accountable to listening as well as speaking? What happens when a private aesthetic act is publicly shared and when individuals have to become accountable to their speech act? Are receivers confused by it, inspired by it, welcome it? At the very least, it seems to me that this is a place where a kind of micro gesture, including these gestures, the intimacy of a micro gesture finds its way into a systemic structure for activating public assembly, a space of reenacting and reconnecting with public good and public things, and we'll say public duty. So it's this transition that always intrigues me, and it's this that, um, on which I'll end, because this is the dialectical place, it seems to me, where freedom and speech meet the ethic of transparent public accountability and public duty. To quote Wendy Brown again, if arts can activate systemic transformation, oh, maybe I don't even have her up here. Oh, I don't. Well, I'll just cite her for a second, remembering that what she, is, what she says is that, that, that we could reassert the demos, the power of collective political sovereignty in stories shared, stories heard, promises made, promises betrayed, promises kept. Narratives performed, sung, chanted, videotaped, ritualized, monumentalized, projected, and celebrated. Whether reenacting the civic in the city or reperforming the public sector in public art, such practices are an attempt to animate invisible public systems, reminding us that such systems are central to the maintenance of an equitable and democratic life. These are moments where it seems to me the social value and where the idea of social value and the idea of aesthetics reimagine each other. When the public sees itself in labor agreements, reanimated factories and mills, in manifestos, community meetings, potlucks, hugs, plazas, parks, and otherly pu public-minded governance systems. Throughout Suzanne Lacey's projects and throughout the projects supported here at Manchester under the leadership of Alistair Hudson, it seems to me such operations are central to the art form. In these projects, the expansiveness of an aesthetic imagination and a social imagination converge, where there is almost literally a conceptual attempt to connect the micro forms of neighbors and the macro forms of public processes, to jump scales. Such work requires incredible amounts of skill. It, it requires mapping systems and scheduling systems and curatorial systems and interpersonal systems and people like Holly and people like Leanne and people like this entire team. It also um, needs university systems committed to the ideas of freedom of speech and accountability. It depends on teams that are aesthetic and social in their skills and their speculative tendencies together constituting a supporting apparatus that allows all participants to, in the words of Neil Smith, jump scales, to take the leap, to invite and withstand debate, and to jump those scales together, sometimes embracing disagreement, but always in ever committed collaboration. Thank you. Wow, Sh Shannon, you're so brilliant. That's fabulous uh, sort of analysis of so many of the 
kind of issues and problems that exist in this field. I think that we had intended to open this up fairly quickly to um, a group conversation, and that's hence you're all sitting in the round. But uh, before we do, I would like to see if Leanne has any response and if Alistair has any response. Mine to you is I find that a very, very inspiring uh, conversation called action and complexification of these practices. So I thank you uh, very much. Do you say anything? Yeah, I think um, that's amazing so much, Shan, for your thoughts. Um, and I guess when I was listening to you, I was very particularly thinking about it in the context of Suzanne's practice. I have a recently created a show here at Whitworth. Um, and I find it so interesting what you're saying and bringing up about um, social practice and that they really hold both of those things together equally. And that's not something that we with all social practice arts. I uh, think, you know, that kind of her and the production of it, the duration of it, and the hundreds of people that she's working with, um, all still, you still able to translate that. I think that coming from her background as a performance artist, um, but still able to translate that today in terms of thinking about that means for a different audience in the same setting. Um, uh, so I guess that was kind of what I wanted to open up conversation on and think about the aesthetic. Her work, and I guess um, what that does within the aesthetic kind of have this kind of idea. If I, if I could just respond because I ended up talking too much, and so I cut a lot of things. But, but I think, but, and, and I'm not saying to, you know, to get, get, <laughs> but I think what is interesting is how much, um, you know, hold that quilt when we start talking about practice aesthetics, or, or the, the line of the border, the yellow lines of those borders, and the use of the yellow are examples in all of her work where you have still relating injury is so wrong. And it is, as Leanne is saying, often um, just for the terms, but is different from other socially engaged practice that where the visual nature is often kind of a little bit unremarkable, but people think it's happening politically also. So thanks for the opportunity to air that more deeply than the doc gave her credit for. Alter, do you want to uh, comment at all on, on Shannon's conversation that's going on? So just reminding really of the conversation we just had that I think was great with the University of Manchester students. Uh, where they brought up so many interesting issues for us. Yeah, I, uh, um, one of the things at the forefront of mind as you were talking was this, this thing I have in my head constantly about, I think one of the primary principal things we need to do now, which is a, which is a recalibration of aesthetics, of how we understand it. And the fact that the, the current, current systems of art and museums and galleries and so on are prohibited, sometimes deliberately, from allowing a fuller understanding of what aesthetics really is and how it works. And, you know, if you think about it, and I think this is what Suzanne's work really um, encapsulates for me, is that if you think about it, as human beings, we mediate the world through sight, sound, touch, through the senses. You know, to, to, be, to be anesthetized is to be desensitized. And aesthetics is the opposite of that, is to sensitize yourself to the world. And as human beings, all our world is, is mediated at, at the first instance in aesthetics. Everything else is downstream from there, right? But we don't tell ourselves that. But the people, for example, who have power in the world, 
the people who are in a position of control, the people who are in a position of in charge of institutions or the people who are in charge of, you know, whatever it is, understand whether directly or indirectly that, con that con to control the aesthetic regime, let's say, let's call it, let's call it that, is a, is a recourse to power and agency. And those that don't have access to that control of aesthetics, whatever that might look like, are those that have had that taken away from them or have it suppressed or have it pushed back. And I think there's lots of projects we've done here that would exemplify that and lots of projects that Suzanne's done that would exemplify that. And I think it's maybe something that could be too complex to explore tomorrow when we talk about youth agency and we look about life pathways. But for me, I think one of the biggest challenges for art institutions and the institution of art is to change the game in terms of how we as a society understand the, how aesthetics works. And I always, uh, some of my talks, I always show that picture of Putin with his top off on top of a horse, mm. right? Which is, this is a guy who has a chief advisor who has a background in avant-garde theater studies who knows how to play the system, who knows how to make things work. You look at the way politics is at the moment. You look at the way big business, corporations, neoliberalism operates at the moment. These guys all understand the importance of aesthetics. That is what is driving our economy, but the economy in the broadest sense, which is the operating systems of society. I would offer, I would offer a, a, a kind of from a perspective on that from the other side that's very interesting. One of the things on the crystal quilt that came up often and often does in my work is why I'm spending money, I think in that case it was $7,000 on shipping in chairs fr from uh, Tennessee. We literally had this whole issue going on where we should, you know, and, and it always comes up in this kind of work. Shouldn't you be spending that money on providing meals, on wheels for seniors? And, and you know, we tried everything. We tried spray painting chairs and putting tape on them and everything to get all the rental chairs matching. Nothing did it. And finally I said, we're just going to spend seven thousand dollars and bring the chairs in from Tennessee, and and you know one of my very wealthy people that was working with me said I've been screaming for a week. I mean I've been begging for bagels for a week, and you're spending seven thousand dollars on chairs, and I think that that's kind of the other side of the aesthetic question is what it costs to produce uh, on a on a scale visual work, the, the border project was really possible based on 1418 Now's generous production funding for not only the project itself, but for that, and for, for the installation. And, and, you know, when one's thinking about people dying and people starving, and it's one of the difficulties that I think we face as people in our daily lives, you know, how much should I live in a house or a, an apartment with an extra bedroom that I use for my study when there are people homeless? And to me, it's the same kind of issue about aesthetics, is, is where does your responsibility as an aesthetic producer start and stop financially? I, I don't know, I mean, I just, it's the other side of, yes, aesthetics are important, the, the control of aesthetics are important, but you could also make the, the claim that it shouldn't be, one shouldn't spend this, that amount of money on aesthetic. It, except that, that the question is asked of you about your chairs because you are doing a socially engaged or politically engaged art project. And nobody is asking the same potentially wealthy person why, why they're spending um, $350 million on a painting at auction. It, because there, there hasn't been that frame of oh, you know that that the that's the suppression of the politics of art and the power of art has happened so um, deeply that nobody thinks to even ask that. I mean, those, you know, yes, you know, there's the newspaper articles about it, but you know what I mean? It's because you've decided to enter the realm of something like social care that then the sort of computation comes in. And for those who don't enter that realm, they don't get asked that question. But, but this, this is also, I think, quite interesting in terms of what you were talking about, these kind of frame jumps. 
okay? Um, because in a, in a way, the, the, the assumption is, is that if you're doing a social project with people from, a, I don't know, a deprived neighborhood or whatever it is, aesthetic shouldn't be a consideration. That's not for you. That's for the guy who spends $350 million on a painting. You know, aesthetics only comes into, it's a, it's a luxury extra that you only get when you've got so far in life. Not a human right. Yeah. Whereas actually, and, and I, I kind of see it in a lot of the work that, you know, you know, happens, for example, we've been doing in healthcare, for example, or, you know, you look upstairs in terms of the, the show we have with um, families who've experienced stillbirth or, you know, the Uncertain Futures Project this morning. The right to have an aesthetic environment, which is not about luxury, it's not about looks, it's about a degree of care. It's, a, it's about a degree of compassion and empathy and sharing and, and understanding what the texture of life should really be like. That, that you know, th th there's something more in that. And I was thinking about the story this morning of someone talking about, you know, with an, our Uncertain Futures women, about somebody who went from one, being a banker in one country to being a cleaner here. And the, and the kind of loss of, you know, self-worth, the loss of, um, capacity that they felt or agency they felt because in a way they were they were in an, a different kind of aesthetic environment you might say a different kind of aesthetic control that they had over their lives that they lost and they were looking to gain again and I, I, I think we have to think quite carefully about what we mean when we you know we think about aesthetics as being this kind of higher level maps to like Laszlo's hierarchy of needs or you know which of course have been questioned so deeply but it's kind of the default to that thing as opposed to you know sort of thinking um, those are all needs <laughs> those are all needs to be fully human in the world I'd like to um, open it up to the audience for comments conversations how do you want to enter uh, this circle that we've created Oh, yeah. Um, I'm surprised to see that there is no reference to architecture in the built environment. I know that might be a little bit simplistic, and I know some of your points are quite abstract, but I just wondered if you could explain why architecture, which I, I think You're is right. an art. You're right. I didn't it. list it. <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. Uh, yeah. The last five years, an urban design uh, group uh, mm -hmm. tried to give people what they want. And getting that message over to them, and for them to understand even where their bins might go, is difficult, let alone to understand some of the things you're promulgating here. You're absolutely right. And I should have, in that opening list of different art forms, I should have listed architecture along with poetry or literature or others. You're absolutely right. And frankly, a whole lots of other talks, talks that are focused only on urban art would entirely talk about architecture and there also think about what it means to begin from a form, from a creative form that already gets credited and has the burden of being understood to be functional in some way and that, and that architects have to face that the dialectic between function and form um, much more deeply immediately as part of your profession. So that in some ways you could say you're, the architects are the proto-social engaged artists. <laughs> you already have the skills. You already know, what, how to, you know how to manage those things. And I have to say, we also know a whole number of, um, of, of architects who actually wanted to push the profession further and ended up needing to engage with in a wider set of visual art practices or performance practices in order to do community work they wanted because they didn't want to be held to a certain version of functionality or a certain version of reality or a certain version of client relations. So there's those who have expanded. But you could say in another way, it's, it's um, the architecture is farther along, or it has, has certain kind of skills that's farther along in, in understanding how these relations work. So thank you for your comment. It yeah, definitely, you know, yeah, calls my bluff or set, you know, sets the scene differently. Thank you. All right, other questions back here someplace? Anybody want to say something or offer a comment?
I'm glad you started with that statement at the very beginning. Um, because I think one of the starting points for socially engaged practices is having a very clear set of political and social values, not fudging from it and being clear, because you can't take a group of people somewhere if you fudge. And I think those, that, that is very important. And if we look at the history of um, human rights and civil rights in this country, we have a whole history of people from the colonies and from the states coming here and pushing those issues forward. For example, Claudia Jones, who comes from an American prison, arrives in London after the murder of a young black boy, sets up Notting Hill Carnival, and in her essay, to, when she sets up Notting Hill Carnival, her statement is, the genesis of a people's freedom is art. And, and I think there is this conversation where we as artists have about our role in society, but there's also the other conversation where the activists are thinking through what their cultural artistic vision is, what they can bring into the art world. And I think that other conversation is, I think if something, one of the women who talked to this morning left the room thinking, I could do this, I can do this. And I think that is, that is where it goes next, is, is the more interesting, is it? I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing, hearing something about the acoustics. What was the question? Well, it, it was, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, he was also wondering about, or not wondering, but commenting on the, the activism um, also influences the art and the artists influence the right. activists. And I, and I asked people here, you said at one point that somebody said, if there isn't something happening, it isn't something. And I, what was the phrase? That some, you were quoting somebody. And she said, if there isn't, Okay, the genesis of people's freedom is art, right. Okay, yeah, so, so great. We love it when they remember that synerg synergy, yeah. Um, and it goes to Alistair's point, too, then, as well, that, um, that in terms of, you know, uh, liberation from basic needs um, and um, uh, that, that it goes hand in hand with, with cultural impulses, aesthetic impulses, with desires to tell stories, that those that they're the, the desire to be free and the desire to express oneself culturally in different in various forms goes hand in hand, um, which is why you know you can also say that even um, when it comes to, and again I didn't hear what you said so I worry if I'm going off on a, but uh, the but if you're talking about um, activism, that can be another place where there's a certain ethos around functionality, you know about what it is to actually be effective that can occasionally um, not remember that connection. So even left allied colleagues who, you know, I have plenty of them, <laughs> um, you know, in putting together, you know, in terms of mobilization and social movements, there can be, sometimes it's also really important to re remember, you know, to remind those colleagues about that intimate connection too. It's not only it's not only the corporate uh, um, figures in power that to which Alistair was referring, that it's an essential part of activism, essential part of all activist history. I do want to say, though, something also that you said that I think that we, we haven't really talked about tonight, and that is the, the, the strong way ethics and um, sort of thoughtful reflection on who, who you're serving, the, the notion of the public good you did bring up, but I think I just I think you're also stressing that that is a common discourse within the field of social practices ethics, and that challenges and questions, you know, you talked about the dialectic and all the various arguments, and a lot of those come, I think, out of various social, political, personal, ethical positions, or trying to think those through. Um, how about over here? Anybody have something they'd like to comment on? Thank you, Sharon. Um, I wonder, you talk about, well, it was a great lecture, of course. Uh, I'm not surprised. Um, what kind of art? And I would try to make this more specific because you talk about the arts and then you list all of them except architecture. But, uh, but, 
is there a difference here between the various art forms? Um, because I think there is. Um, I recently heard, some of you probably did as well, uh, Claire Bishop talking about how participation has went out of, uh, has disappeared in the visual arts, but it's still there in, uh, in the theater, for instance. And it's not to go specifically into this, but when you, for instance, talk about, when you say your point six and seven, aesthetic practices are too abstract to be useful, and then the other one, too useful to be aesthetic, then I think it's very much about the visual arts. Mm -hmm. Because if we go into music, for instance, or literature, it's not like that. It's, uh, you would, and you don't distinguish between this is art, this is not art. You don't say, this is literature, this is not literature. You say, this text has literary qualities, for instance. And, uh, and so what, I would say, what are you really yeah. talking about Great. in Thank these you. 10 yeah. points? Is, no, it, exactly. is it visual arts no, or is I it all of them? Absolutely. I think um, that's right. And I think, um, Birgit, we've talked before and we've worked together before. So you also know that another, another thing that is often important to me, and I didn't overemphasize it here, is intra-art relationships or um, inter, you know, amongst the different forms. Because I actually, um, um, I, actually, I actually don't think that you can make blanket judgments about which is more politically engaged or more useful than others. Or, um, but I think that it is that the different traditions from, the different, from which different artists and art forms come um, set up uh, skill sets and I, you know, conceptions of what is um, uh, appropriate to use, also what feels like a break and what feels like interesting to use. Um, I've said this in other occasions before, what sometimes is a break in tradition, what looks like a break in tradition in one form to create social engagement is actually the perpetuation of tradition in another form. Uh, so, uh, so I think that once you actually really get serious, which I didn't get as serious today about the inter-art dynamics, uh, more things come to the fore. I always remember a long conversation, a conversation from a long time ago with Suzanne when you did a collaboration with a theater person, and it was around race and ethnicity, and you said you had the most debates and um, disagreements with each other based on models of performance coming from theater versus from visual art. More debates about that than about race, <laughs> remember? Um, or if you even just sort of think here about what it is in the circle and the square to incorporate music and sound and to hire a trained, um, trained um, uh, uh, singers and um, c conductors in a particular musical field. Um, well, and also to point out that the films that you all are thinking are so gorgeous are films by Mark Thomas. Yes, by an artist. A local artist. artist yeah. Right, exactly. So, exactly. So when I had, you know, video up there or film up there, these are all, these are all cross-disciplinary, cross-genre practices. But the aesthetic vocabulary that you're right, Birgit, to notice that I am tacitly saying is oppressing and debating us is one that comes from um, a, a, a more of a visual arts understanding of where what modernity did. <laughs> um, a visual arts understanding of what the central moves were, of what feels like, the, what, what felt like flattening versus what feels like expansion. I had a visual art orientation dominating my head when I was putting together this talk. And you're right to notice that that was what was, um, I was moving away from. It would be really different if I was talking to theater people primarily tonight. And John? Yeah, um, first again, Sharon, thanks for an, an incredible talk. Uh, you, you started to touch on some of the things I was, I was going to mention then anyway. But I, I was really interested in what you were just saying before in terms of architecture being almost a priori bend with the expectation to be practical. And also some of the things that I know Alice has been talking about for, for, for many years and we've have been lucky enough to be working with a lot of people who are trying to, to think this through in terms of how we might renegotiate the aesthetic. And um, and for me, that's a renegotiation that that is about power and is about jeopardy 
and, 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 and is about the difficulties of people not wanting to give away what they're secure with and, and, and their operating systems through which they see themselves as the guardians of value. Kind of, we, all, we all know that. And I was, I was wondering what one of the things that I, I know that, that amongst the Association of RTA, uh, RTA Util, for example, that, that we've found useful over the years in trying to rethink the idea of the, the aesthetic and its relationship to dominance is, is to rethink the aesthetic in, in terms of, of use and of use value. So, so, so that operational dialectic between a traditional aesthetic and a tradition of use, what, what happens when you open the doors, when you flip that? And, and for me, to not go on, but to try and, to try and explain what, what I'm driving, I've always been fascinated by that early proposition that Marx makes at the beginning of, of, of Capital, where he, he, makes, he knows he's making a false distinction between use value and exchange value. But use value for Marx right at the beginning of, of, of capital is bodily. It, 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 it's a qualitative bodily necessity or need. And we always see necessity and need as the kind of the base of the hierarchy. But, but it's actually for Marx, it, it's qualitative. And, and, and where he sees the exchanges as, as, as abstract and, you know, and quantitative. And, and in that strange dialectic that you put so beautifully about, about how you operate on that cusp between art and neoliberalism. I, I think it's really interesting to start to think, to think how, can we, how can we rethink art in terms of use in, in, in order to re-empower ourselves to, to put a quality back into a neoliberalism which wants to quantify everything to, 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 to the nth degree. Uh, I lo wonderful question. I feel like it helps bring in so many of the things that others have been brought, bringing up, and so Alistair should respond as well. The, um, but what, since you invoke, so what I'm getting to try is the notion of rethinking aesthetic as one thing, but also rethinking use. And Leanne, also, if you have things to say about this, that, um, that first of all, that that, that notion of, um, that you know, Suzanne and Alistair were bringing up of like, first we have to feed people, then they're allowed a cultural life. And I said, that conforms to Laszlo's hierarchy of needs, that sort of notion. That of course maps to Marx's um, famous, you know, the base is basic, and infrastructure is this ideological abstract thing on, on this, as if it doesn't have the deep fundamental power as if it's not doing a whole lot of useful things, <laughs> right? In all of its ideological work, and it's also that domain that contains usually the cultural life with, that helps um, various of us feel that we're human active agents in the world. So it seems like in many ways that um, when you're talking about rethinking use, we need to get ourselves out of exactly these hierarchical models that we keep that we've been prescribed, you know, re-invoking and feel ourselves accountable to. The the hard thing is that for me, that it's often the artists who help for me defamiliarize the concept of use. So we have to let the artists in in order to do that. But that's sort of it. Is is to um, when I'm often sort of saying of, of, of thinking about what it means to bring abstraction into the realm of social relations, um, even to bring, you know, make sweeping into an art project, is to ask questions repeatedly over and over about what is functional and what is meditative and what is restorative and who is a woman and what is a man. And, and you just don't even uh, think about how even that early project was an invitation to rethink use, right? So to what degree could we take that tiny little moment into something much more macro to address all of the issues that you bring up? But I think it's really good to, at, this, at these types of moments, to figure out comebacks for Suzanne at these moments that say, actually, I really have a different idea of function. <laughs> I have a really different idea of utility here. Um, and again, Alistair, Leanne, and Suzanne have lots of things to say about this probably too, so thanks for questions.
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a problem, I think, that we think use isn't, can't be beautiful. That we think they're, it's somehow, that they're, that they're separate entities. And, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, in a way, that's an argument I think we have to persist with, because it's an argument, you know, th th this is an argument that works against social practice, you know, and we've seen it time and time again, is that somehow, yeah, it's social practice, it's, you know. And there was a moment where everything in social practice looked like stuff made out of raw wood <laughs> with people eating stuff around it, right? And which, which kind of... That's how we know it's authentic. Ma ma ...maintain the myth <laughs> to a certain extent. But it also, um, that conversation also then prompts me to introduce a slightly philosophical, more abstract conception, if you'll forgive me, which is the one that our friend Stephen Wright introduces in the lexicon of usership, which is the coefficient of art, which is basically a kind of new framework in which we, we might start to recalibrate aesthetics. So we no longer think, is this art or not? Is this architecture or craft or performance or theatre? If we if we if we rethink the system completely and say no, everything involves an aesthetic competence or an aesthetic factor. But and then, then the question is, to what degree is this art? What art competences? What art skills? What what level of artness do we have in sweeping the floor, in running a country, in delivering a health service, in trying to bring a community in Briarfield together. And then actually I think you start to see in, that, in those modes of usership of everyday life, what layers and, and, and kind of accents and degrees of aesthetics we can bring into play. So you can sweep a floor really badly and half-heartedly. Like if you've, you're a banker and you go, oh, how the hell did I end up here? But if you're, you know, sweeping the floor to your master ceramicist in, in Tokyo, then, of course, you sweep with the full gusto of an apprentice. So I think, that for me, this, this is a real... Something that I think still needs to be worked upon and, and needs to be reframed. And, but, but I think, it, for me, it's a key to changing, changing the game in terms of how art is understood in society, how museums are understood, how galleries, how gallery spaces, that you start to find ways to lose the, those edges, those hard edges. And it gives you another tool to understand the world. I think as well, if we're thinking about use, you know, there is a use in the beauty of the aesthetic. So if we do stick with the example of Suzanne's work here, um, the way in which it's presented, I mean, first of all, it's interesting when you were bringing up those questions, you know, the critique of the chairs, these critiques that, you know, are never leveled at other kinds of exhibitions, really. It, it's social practice, which is exposing um, in a kind of way that lots of other artistic practices aren't. Um, but in presenting it in the way that it is here, it has other uses. So, for example, this, uh, yesterday morning, um, all of the guys that were involved in making that project in Pendle with Suzanne, they brought down the chief executive of Berry Council and some of their um, local people who are involved in another project now to kind of say, come and look at this. This is what we've already done. This is what we can achieve. Um, and so it has those different uses in those more practical ways as well. Yeah, and that connects a bit with, you know, some, I think some of the conversations we're going to have tomorrow and some of, the, some of the conversations we've had over the last few years with, particularly with neighbourhood groups from around us, who, on the one hand, there's an accusation that places like the Whitworth or Art is somehow posh. And I think what they mean by that is you really care about, the, you know, the way you do things, which is, again, tied into that hierarchy of need question. But I think what they do see is they value, they also value that at the same time that if they could also have that claim to that quality, to that environment, and uh, as you say, for the people involved, the users of that project in Briarfield, to see that presented here in the power of the institution and all the trappings that go with the Whitworth, to see that there mm -hmm. has enormous power and agency for them, where they could go, the chief executive to go, wow, look what, look what our communities did. 
and how they did it as well with such quality. But I, I really want to introduce a couple of other words. I'm quite familiar with Stephen and with usership and, and, and those ideas, but I also want to uh, use, uh, introduce the word that I'm actually much more relate to in my work, which is relationality. And it's sort of the intimacy of, of two people that extends to the intimacy of 50 people that extends to the intimacy of 300 people to the networks and relationships that create the work. My friend Jill from college, Kian's just come in, who is the amazing producer of the project in uh, Ireland. And I think that for me, the, uh, and then the other piece of that is experience and, um, and kind of uh, being moved by a work. And I think that when you talk about usership exclusively, you, you really, it still becomes somewhat transactional. So I'd just like to not discount that, but to add back the fact that you know, I mean, I remember once Claire Bishop leaving Crystal Quilt exhibition and, and she was like this and her girlfriend says, well, you know, there's, she doesn't like that kind of emotional appeal and that work precisely... It's up there, 2012. Yeah. Heard, right. Thing, so. And that work precisely <laughs> draws upon your experience of your matriarchal, you know, your, your grandmothers. That there's... And, and that work operates in a lot of other ways and is conceptualized in a lot of other ways, but it's accessible based on that emotional response. And for me, what's interesting about work is, and what gets into a little bit when we start talking about usership and when Stephen goes on and on, and I like to fight with him about it, because, because I think the work really operates when it operates on multiple levels, on the cognitive level, that it fits into art and art questions and art his historical thinking, but that it also appeals to, you know, what I like to say is my mom and dad in Wasco, that they understand the work in a very different way. And I think the success of what you're doing here is that you will have people from Moss Side, you will have young people who, who uh, for whom this is not a, a, an experience that they understand, and you will have people like Shannon and, and all of yourselves in the room simultaneously relating on multiple levels to the work. Uh, That's also when I had my list, which could go on forever, about the different social values that undergird socially engaged art, that for some it is about the affect and affective connection, and some are allergic to it, but, and, and, and it, it just it is actually about how to have multiple modes of engagement still ever present in the room and not, to not discount that possibility. And that different receivers, even in the same moment, might, ha might be experiencing sociality differently. And that is actually what makes it democracy. And so I think um, that I'd be curious, we've, we've got two mic runners in the back who I've completely um, taken their job away from them. I'm wondering back there or here, do you have any comments or um, other kinds of questions for us? Kian, I can't imagine you don't have a comment, but Truda? Go on here. Truda? Yeah, I, I was thinking, I have you here, so I have to ask this question. Um, normally, when you evaluate a social practice work, um, you, you tend to use, um, for example, you, you go into a, uh, 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 you evaluate, for example, the artist, what kind of relationship the artist has to the collaborators. Is it ethical? Is it, um, and you, we have seen many debates about artists not being ethical to their collaborators and that is condemned in a way. And uh, for example, Claire Bishop uh, also is another, you know, opposite uh, uh, standpoint uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, well, okay, let me just rephrase. Uh, for example, Grant Kester is talking about, is trying to develop a, a new way of evaluating these works, social practice works that are, in a way, trying to get rid of the autonomy aesthetic system. You know, the art history based on canons, um, sectorization of society into social 
into art history and social history and never shall they meet. But these works put these together. So what would you say, you are here, uh, and all of you, um, when do you think and why do you think uh, and in what way is a work like this um, good or functioning or really a good work? And when does it not really succeed? It's a liberal world, but when does it really not work? Is it when you have a constellation of the aesthetics and the ethical and the political? And you see, is it, is it when it at the same time is really um, let's say, working well together. That's what I think. They can see what, can see what others say. But, um, uh, I'm not going to bring up Claire Bishop again. <laughs> it's so funny that that, because I, I don't think she feels like being credited with an argument that, that is now so old. Um, all the time, that we can't get entirely stuck in that repeating of that argument. Um, but it's interesting what kind of traction it had. Um, because I actually think, um, first of all, I, I, if I can myself, who's a, not a practitioner anymore and a, um, a scholar and a teacher, I tend to try to, I tend to find myself gravitating um, to projects that I think of as having a social rigor and an aesthetic rigor, and that I learn something about both supposedly opposing domains, including um, the false line between them um, through engagement with the project. So that tends to be like a, a kind of a uh, threshold for me to be excited about a project. Um, but I also think that, you know, because I was wondering what your ultimate question was going to be and thinking about some of the other things that you said um, and thinking about some of Alistair's points or uh, these other questions, that, that when, we're, when we say that we might be worried about how a, a history of aesthetics is told and what the notion of what aesthetics is um, and how it's taught, I'll say, as somebody who came from the performing arts first, I was not taught this aesthetic history uh, right away that, that animates the field for most of you. Um, and so I had my own strange, wild ways of reading some of that history. And, and in doing that, you know, I would read Schiller really differently. And I'd read... Um, you know, a Jackson Pollock painting really differently. And I read Harold, Harold um, Freeman was, as opposed to um, um, uh, Michael Freed on Jackson Pollock, you know. And, 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 and in all of those cases, you actually might find in various art histories, whether they're visual art histories or theater histories or architectural histories, um, lots of moments when there's much more of a relationship amongst these supposedly different domains, and you can read them against the grain for how they're being taught, against the grain for how they're being received. And there might be a whole lot more, um, a whole lot less to overcome <laughs> um, if you start to read those histories more dif you know, differently and against the grain of how they're traditionally taught right now or traditionally disseminated in art forum books and things like that. So that's sort of a side note. I, just quickly, I, I think you want to come in, but I have a slightly more simplistic answer to your question, which I think is specifically around the kind of umbrella of social projects or social engaged projects. And for me, in all my experience, a good project is when people are involved in it willingly and that they want more. And I think, you know, it, it, it's clear from example, look at Circle and Square, look at uh, Uncertain Futures Project today, the people involved in that are doing it because it's, it's doing something for them. They're not doing it because they've been asked to. 
because they'd stop doing it if they weren't getting any, anything out of it. They're doing it because they're getting something out of it. And for me, that's, in a way, that's kind of the ultimate litmus test. But it would also apply, for example, to that constable painting on the wall. If I walk through here and I see someone looking at that painting, getting something out of it, whatever it is, even if they've never seen it before, that is having a use, that is having a function, but it is also aesthetic at the same time. And they're doing it willingly, not because somebody's told them, if you look at that, it's really good for you, which has happened in the past, let's face it. But then I wouldn't uh, call it, it's useful. I would say that in the case of, for example, in certain futures, people are aligning their values and they're creating, they're mutually creating an agenda. They're listened to, they're, we last night tore apart, <laughs> they tore apart my great plan for a dinner that we were gonna have. And you know, if it was a real full-on performance, I would have been a little bit more resistant and a little bit more defensive. But you know, I, th I think that when you really deeply take on board and try to sort through critique and, and people's commentary and people's vision, you know, and really ethically listen to it, don't, I don't cap, I don't sort of capitulate if I feel strongly about something, but I make the arguments, and this goes back to something we said in the very beginning. For me, transparency is all. And uh, I think to make my opinions clear and allow them to be challenged and develop relationships in that process, respectful relationships with everybody, I think that's um, um, you know, how I would counter the useful. Um, argument, but I do want to say that for me, that I think what I like and and under, it's really not just the visual for me, but the good social practice work. It's that I'm, I'm kind of like aha, you know, it's that aha moment that you talk about in Buddhism, where you sort of say, wow, I haven't thought of it that way, or that coheres in a way that I can't even imagine. So it's not even always visual. It could be an idea, you know. And I want to, Leanne, do you want to say something? And then we have to end very quickly. Oh. I guess I would just say if there was a kind of a Venn diagram of good social practice, you would have, you know, the, the production, which would be the ethical rigor that you would apply to the way in which you work with communities. There would be the aesthetic, and then there would be the form, because, you know, that we do show this in museums, so it's how then does it, is, is a form created within the museum space and how is that communicated with audiences and how does that then go on to have a different kind of life for different publics? And then in the middle, you'd have good social practice and you'd also kind of have a Suzanne because, you know, on Uncertain Futures, Suzanne has met with those women every single week on Zoom for two years. And when she comes into the gallery, um, what we do here and what the program that we've done, what kind of city would have been absolutely nothing without Suzanne being here, challenging the staff, asking us questions, pushing us harder. Um, and I, so I think, you know, there is something special about the artists themselves within that in terms of making it good, good art. But speaking of collaboration, I have to say that when I spot somebody that's good, like Leanne, I can't tell you how many decisions I left to her. I'm just kind of like, oh, do the color of the walls, whatever you want, because I already figured out she really knows color, right? And in the back, before we have one more question, but I want to, yeah, we have one question from Ruby, and then I want to, um, one last thing, and then we're finishing. I was actually just about to talk a little bit about collaboration, because I find it really interesting with your work that, so with some artists, when they work with a certain community, particularly one that they don't identify with, there can be a certain element of them using that community or that person or that experience. You know, you, um, I can think of uh, an artist where they kind of took stories from working class people that they were themselves were upper middle class, they didn't understand that experience and then made an artwork from it, but without any sort of consent, any collaboration, and it was quite sort of icky, for lack of a better word. And what I find quite interesting about your work is that collaboration and how much it is sort of left to the people that you collaborate with to tell their own stories rather than you kind of framing it going, well, this is what I want there to be, you know, come out of this artwork. I want you to talk about this specific thing. 
but actually just giving them the agency to tell their own stories and, and tell what they want to talk about. Um, and I just find it quite interesting is, you know, with the communities that you've worked with, you know, with people in Ireland and people in Briarfield, that you're not necessarily from those communities. And I find it quite interesting how you relate to that experience and what is your starting point in working with those communities and working in that way? So I, I think it's, Ruby, we can have this conversation a little bit further later, but uh, because we need to end now, but I want to say that, you know, part of it is that I don't give agency, and the primary example is Kian Smith, who brought me to Ireland, told me what to do, had me drive him all the way through Ireland along the border while he looked out and gave me great ideas for what we would do together. Kian, do you want to say something? You'll be here uh, Saturday with John McAuliffe's day, the Creative Manchester Project, and Kian will be here on the first panel. Hello. Um, it's just nice to be here and to see you again. Um, now, the only comment I make, I got to see some of the live stream before I arrived, so I saw Shannon talking about um, about neoliberalism and uh, arts practice, and I, I'll just leave it with this short sort of perspective on it, coming from Northern Ireland, which is obviously a post-conflict place. We, we, those of us who've worked in the arts there for the last 20, 30 years, Good Friday Agreement will be 25 years old next year, and we're only starting to see the first young adults come out of, you know, so there's a generation now that never experienced the political violence um, in of the troubles, um, that's not to say that things haven't happened since either. But my point is, is that that idea of governments commodifying the use of arts practice as a form of um, social welfare within communities. So, arts practice in terms of building, um, combating bad mental health, in terms of bringing communities together. In ter so, there's always these other reasons to do art and they're not to do with making art. And, um, and that's a real problem, because we're a small place, the economies of scale there don't really warrant a lot of public investment in the arts, so it's poorly invested in the first place. So artists are often found stretching themselves in many different directions, in education, in health, and all sorts of different ways. So I was really struck by that uh, point. I think it totally builds into everything you were saying. So thank you very much for coming and, and um, really appreciate coming tomorrow and the next day to um, what kind of city? Thank you, Ian, Suzanne, and Shannon. Thanks for coming. So tomorrow, tomorrow, come here for more on youth agency, etc. And come again on Saturday, where for borders uh, with John and Kim. So yeah, thanks again, and um, yeah, have a drink. Okay.